with this book, God's Word. So, uh, testing frame of reference. So, don't ask me any trivia. Great. What about the dinosaurs? Great. Uh, <laughs> well, dinosaurs. On day six. <laughs> Nice. Uh, I was talking to Dave a little bit uh, this morning, but I want to get uh, your guys' uh, uh, view on it. Uh, dealing with uh, people within the, the church, assuming uh, they Christian, um, they have the viewpoint of worshiping God more with the emotion, and they pretty much see people like us as uh, worshiping God through the intellect, and it's, it's not good, it's not it's not the way. How do you deal gently, lovingly with uh, people uh, with that view? Because you can bring the scripture to them and you can, you can talk about scripture and they say they value scripture but they really don't. Yeah, it's like it's not spiritual. Uh, yeah, like it's kind of a, uh, it's sort of a different way, you know, kind of anti-intellectual acting yeah, it's Christian. I, think it's, I like what Francis Schaeffer used to define true spirituality as, as propositional truth plus personal relationship. And it's, it's not either or, it's both end. There's no such thing as, you know, asking God for forgiveness, dear Lord, I, I've attained too high a level of propositional truth. I need to cut it back. I'm sorry. I, I learned many truths about you. And you can't have too much of that, and you can't say, oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm experiencing you too much. Uh, but the problem is, is when you try to have one at the expense of the other. So if you try to experience God without a, a good and healthy emphasis on uh, propositional truth, how do you know it's the God of the Bible you're experiencing? Can you define propositional truth? Well, propositional truth just means statements of truth, like, like the doctrinal truths taught in the scriptures. See, before you can trust in Jesus for salvation, you have to know who he is. And so there's certain truths about Jesus that you have to believe with your mind before you can then commit to him and trust in him for salvation and then enter into that personal relationship um, uh, with him. So it's, it's like Jesus said, true worship is God of spirit, those who worship those who worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus said of the Pharisees, you guys search the scriptures daily thinking that in them you have eternal life, but the scriptures speak of me. And in me you have life, but you guys are refusing to come to me. So, so it, it's not either or; it's it's both end. And if we if we try to have uh, experience of God without based on biblical truth, we're probably going to end up worshiping a false god. Uh, but if we try to have the doctrinal truth without that personal relationship with the Lord, we're liable to just get a, a bunch of head knowledge and and. Uh, and uh, you know, you, you could memorize John 3.16, you could break it down, you could understand it in the English and in the Greek, but if you don't apply it to your life and actually enter into that faith uh, relationship with the Lord Jesus, you're still not saved. So I, I would just I would just encourage you to take up the passages like that, and like Isaiah 118, where God says, Come, let us reason, and say, I I commend you, find that common ground, I commend you. Um, for seeking God's face, uh, but you also have to seek the mind of God as well. And and you know, if God wanted to, He would have, he, he could have given us a tract, but He didn't. He gave us a big book, the Bible. And this was an easy book to interpret. We wouldn't even have this conference. Uh, so, and if God wasn't into us learning more and more about truths about Him and about the world He created, then why in the world did He take this genius thing, Saul of Tarsus? And ask him to write such a big chunk of the New Testament. So uh, I think there's probably more debates about what Paul means in Romans 9 than you have about the key port passages of, of Plato's writings or Aristotle's writings. So, uh, so you know, if, if you're trying to come up with turning Christianity into an anti-intellectual thing, it's really not do justice to the God of the Bible. We are certainly emotional creatures. And you know, the expression and the experience of emotions is a vital part of our human uh, uh, persona. But emotions must be controlled by the intellect rather than the other way around. So you need to point out something like that. And from the standpoint of the scriptures, uh, you can 
demonstrate the emotional life through the whole issue of music, which uh, is your expertise. So there's the emotional side of it. But our musical appreciation, as well as our emotions, must be governed by our knowledge uh, of God based on the scriptures. So the way to deal with such a person is to, in love and, and, and patience, conduct him through a study of the urgency for spiritual growth. Okay, uh, Many passages, you can go to my website and I look under the topical index under S for spiritual growth and you will find an abundance of information concerning the urgency of growth uh, from the scriptures. Uh, we, and the references can be used all or, or partial to explain to this person, which can be summed up by the statement of uh, Peter at the end of his second letter, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the issue in our Christianity, is to grow in knowledge. Emotions cannot be eliminated from the equation. In fact, with proper knowledge, emotions will naturally express themselves. Okay? But if we put the cart... That's a byproduct. Uh, but if we put the cart before the horse, then emotions will dictate our relationship with God, our experience with God, and that's where all kinds of distortion comes in. I feel this way. This is what I feel. God told me. I felt the Holy Spirit. Okay, I felt this, I felt that. Instead of letting the Word of God dictate what God has revealed, instead of how I feel. I need to know the word, I can deliver the word, but the saving part has nothing to do with me, so there's no emotion on my part. I mean, I'm happy if they get saved, but I might not be, is that kind of in line with, with what you're saying here? Well, there's a mandate in scripture that, uh, you know, we are our ambassadors for Christ. At least that's the direction of each believer. And I think the church has failed tremendously in not, uh, as if we're causing this growth process to take place, uh, how it's prescribed in the Bible. You know, there are, there, are, there, are, there are key things about pursuing the growth process. Number one is the desire. Peter talks about it, desiring the milk so we can grow in respect to something that we've received. It's called salvation. And uh, then Paul writes to Timothy and tells him that uh, the value of the scripture, all of it is valuable and is profitable or beneficial for doctrine and proof and correction and instruction and righteousness. Thus, a man may be thoroughly equipped for every service. So until a person is thoroughly equipped, it seems to me that we are sending people out in the fray a little bit prematurely, you know. But uh, to attain to that concept or the mindset of ambassadorship is what the pursuit should be and not so much because God has put in place and we have to trust and rest in the fact that what is going to happen where salvation is going to occur is that every person that was foreknown by God will be saved. Now, how quickly do you want to participate in that activity? Because God allows us to participate in that activity. And when we are prepared, when we have a workable use of the gospel, and we're able to present it in a manner where it can be received as truth. And, and, and the Holy Spirit can use that as a convicting thing or a drawing uh, part of his ministry. So uh, I think we, we worry a little bit too, we put the cart before the horse, so to speak. 